I appreciate everybody being here this morning and, uh, and joining us. We've got a really kind of interesting panel, particularly, I think, to wrap up comments that you know, many of the other folks have, have provided, but then provide a kind of unique perspective on where we're going. You know, no small number of issues in the acquisition process. Uh, for those that uh, haven't met me, I'm Hondo, uh, former ASN RDA, now has been um, kicking around here. It's good to be back and see a, a number of you with, with us here. Um, for the panel, we've got three uh, pretty amazing uh, panelists here. The first is Admiral Poland. He is a vice commandant of the Coast Guard. Uh, so I think the 33rd vice commandant of the Coast Guard. For those who don't kind of know that role, you're kind of the COO for the service. You basically get all the jobs that the commandant doesn't want to do. <laughs> um, and, and you translate kind of broad intent into day-to-day -day actions. Interestingly enough, he is also the acquisition executive uh, for the Coast Guard. Most folks don't know that. Got a very distinguished uh, background, been an area commander, division commander, I was the head of operations at Southcom. Uh, interestingly, he was the incident commander at Deepwater Horizon uh, oil spill. Uh, has some more degrees than uh, I can possibly <laughs> list out here. And so please uh, join me in welcoming Admiral Poland to the panel. Thanks. Second on the list is uh, Admiral, uh, Vice Admiral uh, Spanky Morley. He is the deputy to the ASN RDA. Uh, so the most senior military acquisition officer in the Department of the Navy. Uh, he comes uh, again in that role, um, besides advising the ASN RDA, his real key function is synchronizing requirements, resourcing, mm -hmm. and acquisition. So he, ahead with the head budgeter of the Navy and the head requirements officer for the Navy, they kind of keep everything synchronized and rolling and, and generating that, that capability. Uh, Spanky comes from, again, a very distinguished career. Uh, he's had a number of roles. He ran international programs. He was the F-18 program manager. Uh, he was the first uh, pilot to land an F-18EF on a carrier. I think like 3,500 flight hours and 700 kind of things. So he hit his head a lot on the, uh, <laughs> on the cockpit. Um, a gr great, great acquisition officer. Uh, been in the job for almost almost three years, three years now, uh, and so again, a really broad perspective there. So please uh, welcome Admiral Morley to us. And then uh, l last but certainly not least is uh, Dr. Smith Carroll. She is in OSD. She runs uh, and is in charge of the uh, uh, surface warfare program. So works directly for the Secretary of Defense in the uh, Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition Sustainment providing expertise and oversight of all of these programs uh, for OSD. She, again, uh, uh, an incredible background and career. She was the s and advisor, if I remember when, for the, for the head of requirements in the Navy uh, in the ASN RDA shop. Uh, she used to run all the unmanned and autonomous uh, programs, uh, has 30-something papers and a patent <laughs> and a doctorate degree and and super, super technical uh, background. So please welcome her to the panel as well. <laughs> so uh, spoiler alert, we're not gonna sit up here and yammer the whole time. Um, we're, gonna take, uh, we're gonna leave a bunch of time for questions. So please feel free as we kind of get um, to that part of the uh, agenda, come up to the mic uh, and I'll, I'll kind of ping back and forth, uh, ask any questions, free fire zone here. Uh, if you've got a question to a particular panelist, uh, let us know. If it's kind of a free-for-all, uh, you want to throw it up here to chew on, then we'll, uh, we'll kind of address it that way. Uh, I'm going to start here uh, letting each of the panelists have a few minutes for some opening comments. I'll throw in a couple of questions to start things out, and then, as I say, we'll leave a good amount of time here for Q&A for any of you uh, that want to ask questions directly. So I'm going to turn it over now to the Vice Commandant, uh, give a couple of opening thoughts as we kick this panel off. Well, thanks, Hondo, and thanks to the Navy League for just an incredible Sea Air Space uh, Symposium, and uh, to all the sponsors, thank you for making this happen as well. Uh, I want to start by talking about the why. I, I don't think you can talk about acquisitions unless you take a little bit of a lesson from Simon Sinek and first define the why. Um, the why for us in recapitalizing our Coast Guard is because the demand 
for the Coast Guard has never been higher. We feel like we're in the era of Coast Guards. And the demand for Coast Guard has never been higher because of, of a number of different things. One, the criticality of the marine transportation system, which contributes $5.4 trillion to national GDP. And you don't have to look any farther than the tragedy in Baltimore to understand the importance of the marine transportation system. Uh, the, the second is when you talk to partner nations, and I don't care if you're in the Gulf of Guinea or in the Indo-Pacific, when you talk to partner nations, or in, even in the Caribbean or South America, and you ask them what is their greatest national security concern, they will tell you that it's the effects of climate change, it's illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing, it's the challenges of maintaining their maritime borders and patrolling their own maritime sovereignty. It's about maritime governance. And those are Coast Guard missions. That's where we fit, I think, a unique role within the joint force. And so we have seen demand climb for the Coast Guard and presence matters, presence matters. I look at what we're doing in the Indo-Pacific with the Harriet Lane, and those of you who uh, attended some of the Commandant's remarks, uh, she, she referenced the fact that we've got the Harriet Lane, which is a Pacific support cutter that's doing really great work in, in um, reaching out to Oceania and the Pacific Island nations. Uh, again, that just underscores that presence matters. Uh, I think about the work that we're doing in the CENCOM AOR, our six fast response cutters that are working out of Bahrain, Again, providing a unique capability to the joint force to interdict conventional weapons and narcotics that are being trafficked in that part of the world. I think about our cutters and our crews that are down in the Caribbean basin uh, uh, interdicting migrants that are leaving on, from Cuba, Dominican Republic, or Haiti on craft that should never be at sea. This is a life-saving mission. Let me make no, no question about that. This is a life-saving mission and we need to be present to save lives. And I think about the work that we're doing in the drug transit zones, whether it's in the Eastern Pacific or whether it's in the Caribbean with our cutters, trying to interdict narcotics before they can make it to the streets of our neighborhoods. Um, so that's sort of the mission part of the why. The other part of the why is we need to recapitalize because we're doing this right now with assets that are well over 50 years old uh, when I look at the marine transportation system, we have construction tenders that are 80 years old. Think about that. Most of those construction tenders are 50 years old. Most of our large capital assets are 50 years old. We talk a lot about the Polar Star and what the Polar Star has been doing in the breakout in Antarctica. Well, we haven't constructed a heavy icebreaker in the United States since the 1970s. We've only got one medium icebreaker as part of our inventory to work the North Pole. And, and I would tell you that the Arctic, to me, is the epicenter for global geostrategic competition. And we have to be present in those spaces. We've got 865s that are flying that were designed in the 1980s. And the world has changed. The world has changed since we established those requirements, since we built those assets. And again, presence matters. And it's, it, it's vital that we be able to project presence anytime, anywhere, because I think national strategic interests rely on our ability to exercise our authorities, to exercise our partnerships, to meet our partner nations where they're at. Uh, so uh, another part of the why, uh, so I've, I've talked about the mission why, I've talked about sort of the asset why, but now there's a, a maintenance and a, a human aspect to the why. It is expensive to maintain the legacy assets that we're maintaining. You heard the Commandant talk about the fact that we are only funding depot level maintenance to about 50% of what we need. We need the newer assets. We need to leverage the technology. Um, and we need to provide greater crew habitability to our crews. Many of these cutters that are operating were built in an analog Coast Guard. We've tried to monetize, it, modernize them with digital technology, but largely they are analog platforms in a digital age and in a, an age of digital complexity. Um, so that's, that's sort of the why. Um, so now what are we doing about it? We are on our largest shipbuilding campaign since World War II, and I, I, I appreciate the administration support, and I am so grateful to the congressional support that we have. We are looking to build new heavy icebreakers. We hope to build Arctic security cutters that will be a complement to those heavy icebreakers. 
We're engaged in constructing a new class of offshore patrol cutters. The first one, Argus, is in the water at Eastern Shipbuilding. We're going to build the second phase of that cutter at Austell. We're going to deliver our 11th national security cutter out of Huntington uh, Ingalls in the not too distant future. And we're building waterways commerce cutters to replace those aging fleet, that aging fleet of construction tenders and inland river tenders. Uh, and at the same time, we're looking to recapitalize our aviation fleet. We want to accelerate into an all H-60 rotary wing fleet. We want to expand our program of record for C-130Js. Uh, and then we have to leverage unmanned systems. We're very much at the precipice of unmanned systems, but we know that that has to be part of our enduring fleet mix. Uh, so how do we get there? How do we stay on track and task? I think it starts with making sure that we have predictable and, fund and, and stable funding. It, is, it creates uncertainty and ambiguity if we don't have predictable and stable funding on these programs of record. It creates ambiguity for the service, it creates ambiguity for our partners, it creates ambiguity for our workforce, and it creates uncertainty for the defense industrial base. And then we need to enable a world-class acquisitions workforce. We need an acquisitions workforce that is technically competent, that has the agility to pivot to the realities of today's world and today's budget realities. And, and that's how we buy down risk and how we deliver the capability that the nation needs for its Coast Guard. So let me just stop there. Um, I thank you for the opportunity, Hondo, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Admiral Morley? Okay. All right, well, as far as the Navy goes, I think uh, uh, we're pretty good with shipbuilding. That's, that's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Spoken like a true aviator. There you go. Yeah. Well, well, and speaking of that, to maybe help uh, help with credibility. Although I'm an aviator, I was uh, the ship panner of the year in 1999, but I was never pilot of the year of anything. So, uh, so maybe <laughs> that'll help a little bit for this one. So, uh, sir, thanks a lot for uh, having the opportunity. Thanks to uh, everybody uh, sticking it out to Wednesday morning uh, as we go. So, let's see a couple of things. Um, so obviously shipbuilding is a key challenge for this decade. It's really our generational challenge uh, for those of us now in this business to, uh, to, to set the stage. And this is a, a pretty daunting task. The, uh, the vector is pretty clear. Um, the, uh, we're undergoing a generational submarine construction. We're undergoing a generational infrastructure uh, effort going on. There's a huge geopolitical sense of urgency. Um, and it's a challenging um, economic environment, uh, which we can, we can talk a little bit about uh, where we go. So it, this really is a strategic imperative, uh, and it's really requiring, in a lot of ways, the whole government uh, to, get, uh, to get behind this. And not just a Navy effort, uh, certainly a huge amount of the Coast Guard. Uh, also, Merritt is doing uh, ship construction as well with their training ships. And as much as it pains me to say, U.S. Army has also got a whole bunch of ships, so we'll call them boats, uh, out there that also needs uh, the industry uh, there. So this is a uh, collective uh, demand signal, if you will, on, on the same workforce uh, there. The vector's clear from a Navy standpoint. Many studies, no matter what number you want to point out, it's all about getting to get larger because of the nature of the threat and the geopolitical environment uh, that, that we're facing. Uh, another aspect of this, you'll hear CNO talk a lot about more ready players on the field. Obviously, one of the levers to pull there is on the sustainment piece and the readiness piece and getting ships and submarines out of the yards faster, more efficiently. Uh, and of course, that's a demand on the same workforce, the same dry docks, et cetera, as we do that. And then there's significant challenges out there, the design maturity, first of class challenges, workforce supply chain, and we can, we can talk to some of those. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the environment we're in. Um, a comment on the d defense industrial base uh, expansion, which I think is always important for folks to reflect on. It's important to understand none of us here have really been a part of a defense industrial base expansion, if you think about it. Um, I doubt there's anybody here that was part of the uh, MRAP program for the Army during uh, the Desert Wars where we stood that up. There's some isolated cases, certainly. But as a whole, defense industrial base expansion, we have all lived our professional lives, whether you're in uniform or in the commercial space or wherever, in really a contracting 
uh, uh, environment with, the, with regards to the defense industrial base as a whole. So we have to first, I think, acknowledge some humility and understand that, that this is all new to all of us. Uh, and the way we go about it and the pressures and the risk tolerances and everything are different and we'll need to think about that. Munitions, um, not that that's shipbuilding, but munitions in my mind is one of the ways that we can teach ourselves some lessons on this. We're undergoing a large munitions industrial base expansion right now for obvious reasons. A munitions expansion is one that can be done in a number of years and is not as complex with as long lead times as perhaps the shipbuilding industry is. Uh, but we can learn things about what stable funding does, what multi-year procurements do, what kind of incentives we put through, how do we change the market uh, environment and the investment of capital decisions that our private companies make, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What signals does the government have to do? What do we have to work with industry? And what does industry have to do? What analysis do we have to do of the supply base? Where do we invest in the tier three, tier four to get ahead of the problem? How do we keep the spigot and the pressure of the pump of, of funding going so that industry has predictability and has a business case to invest uh, in the expansions as well as government investment? So I would look at munitions as our opportunity to teach ourselves many of the things that we need to do in shipbuilding in parallel with a longer uh, turn of investment that we're gonna see here. Submarine industrial base expansion, understand the magnitude of that, five times really what we're looking at. If you think in terms of gross tonnage is a fairly linear factor as to the demand it puts on a workforce and an industrial base from a material standpoint and a human capital standpoint. Um, Virginia, call it a 1.0 metric, now we're going to two Virginias a year, that's 2.0. One Columbia is a 2.5 of Virginia in gross tonnage, that's 4.5. Add on the Virginia payload module, which will start in construction, and that's about a 1.25 of Virginia. And then add on a little bit more for AUKUS to allow us some room there. You're over five times the industrial demand that we're putting on our submarine uh, workforce in order to do that. So a lot of challenges there. Um, we have grown, five years ago, we were one Virginia a year, right? So we're, we're, we're not at two, but we've got two going and we've got Columbia going, and so we're well over 2.0. So we've, we've, we've over doubled the industrial basin's uh, construction, long ways to go, um, but that's kind of the demand that we're talking about. So that's understanding. I mentioned PSYOP, that's a 100 year century type of investment for the nation. Our dry docks, our public dry docks haven't been touched in sometimes that long, as well as the infrastructure, well, as well as the equipment and the efficiency of design in order to uh, put more time on job uh, for, our, uh, for our workforce. Um, so we could talk about that. Two more comments and I'll, uh, I'll shut up. The, uh, uh, a couple of our challenges. There, uh, this is just, just the, the world that we live in. There is a, uh, and uh, Admiral touched on it, there is a um, lack of a uh, commercial shipbuilding industry in this nation, right? We stopped subsidizing that uh, decades ago uh, there, and uh, that has driven the constriction in a very uh, demanding supply base in a com very competitive free market uh, environment there. Uh, that's tough, that's a fragile industry. So as we expand this, again, a lot of challenges, things that we haven't done, um, any of us in our professional lives. That's where, when you talk, when Secretary Del Toro talks about maritime statecraft, that's what he's getting after. We've got to help develop this overall uh, supply base in, and every, th every little bit matters, right? Every little bit of strength we get in a sub supplier in the maritime world, every bit of offload work that we can do from the big uh, prime yards into the, the middle of the country to take advantage of the great workforce that we have there is uh, uh, in any commercial business that we can help derive for the country will take some of that load off and provide us a little bit of buffer and a parallel uh, strengthening of that overall supply base, not only for the Navy, but the Coast Guard and the rest. So that's a big challenge. Uh, and then let me just talk about workforce. National challenge in this, right? We have, we have as a nation kind of devalued tradecraft for a couple of generations uh, on that. We've, uh, we've got low unemployment, which is great, but it's also bad if you're looking for employers. We estimate on the submarine industrial base, 10,000 
additional workers a year over the next decade. That's a tremendous uh, ramp up of people that we need there. Uh, we're in a competitive free market economy with regards to compensation, and we're in a post-COVID environment where there's a, a lot of opportunity for remote work and a desire uh, by many to, uh, to look for that kind of thing. So uh, where's the target on that? Again, collective, whole of government, whole of nation effort, the parents, the high school counselors, right? You see build submarine commercials. You see NASCAR build submarine NASCAR, uh, which was running second in the Daytona with 10 laps to go, by the way, uh, on there. Uh, we've developed training centers, regional training centers around the country. We're bringing in refugees in order to do that and help accelerate citizenship uh, and give folks a trade craft. So, and these are just some of the ideas and we certainly don't have this licked. So it is a whole effort there. I would tell you, a message to send out to, uh, to folks is, uh, look, if you wanna get in the shipbuilding, you've got a profession for life. We have got the demand for the rest of your working uh, lives uh, on that. There are no college loans that will come with it. Uh, the training will be provided. Uh, you will have good pay and believe me, you will have advancement opportunities because uh, it's a young workforce out there uh, that's, uh, so the advancement opportunities are somewhat unlimited. You will provide service to this nation and you will play a role in our national security. So I think that's a pretty strong message and a pretty attractive opportunity for a lot of uh, our young workers out there. And it's certainly I'd encourage everybody to help us spread that uh, in your high schools, your churches, wherever that might be. So I'll leave it there and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks, Frankie. Oh goodness, the, the, the curse of going last, <laughs> pretty much everyone has said what I was probably going to say. So <laughs> great. <laughs> I echo what both of these gentlemen have said, but I'll look through and try to add something where, I'll try to fill in some gaps. Um, I, I do wanna thank the Navy League for actually bringing government and industry together to actually have these conversations. It is very important that we have a venue that we can speak um, openly about these issues and, and work together to try to come to solutions. So I do thank you for that and for hosting this event. Um, Maintaining the uh, shipbuilding uh, industrial base is one of our national security priorities. I mean, it is something critical to our national defense strategy. We need to maintain the right mix of Navy platforms, and that inclu includes a larger mix of those platforms, both crewed and uncrewed, um, to address those global threats that we expect to uh, encounter in the future. But that means we have to balance operational risk, affordability, maintainability, and the industrial based stability that goes along with that. As mentioned, the shipbuilding um, and submarine industrial base are really uh, experiencing an increase in demand. And that demand really needs our help in the form of providing uh, an expansion in capability and capacity. Now, some of the risks that we find are that the supplier base doesn't exist necessarily, shipbuilder performance isn't there, workforce hiring is um, short, and of course, proficiency isn't there. One thing that what I would like to add that really hasn't been addressed is the fact that when you build a, f a first in class ship, there are a lot of interesting new challenges that come uh, with building a first in class ship, which uh, involve a high degree of learning and sometimes that takes a lot more time, a lot more rework, and retaining uh, the highly skilled uh, level of the workforce and experienced engineers that you need to do a first of class ship is key to the success of the build of that ship. So that is, is critical, and we're experiencing some of that now with uh, Columbia. So uh, going forward, uh, I look forward to talking to you about some of these issues, but uh, these gentlemen have already really covered the majority <laughs> of my talking points, so I don't want to bore you with repeating them. <laughs> All the questions to her. Yeah. No, really? <laughs> well, I'm going to, uh, again, I'm going to do a, a quick little lightning round of some okay. questions, and then, you know, we're probably five, ten minutes out uh, for, for you guys to come up and uh, ask questions. Again, come up to the mics here, and we'll... We'll go from there. I'll start back with the Vice Commandant here. So you spoke a little bit about, you know, the largest recap in Coast Guard since World War II. Uh, we've also talked about a lot of the challenges we're seeing. Um, how are you seeing those programs progressing? Where are we making good progress? Where do we have opportunity, whether on the government side or industry, to do better uh, to execute those programs? 
Yeah, thanks for the question. It's a great question. I, it, let me take each class of uh, cutter that we're constructing and sort of break it down. Let me start with the Polar Security Cutter because um, that's the most complex ship that we're constructing right now. We haven't built a heavy icebreaker since the 70s. Uh, it, you don't build an icebreaker the same way you build another naval combatant. Uh, the frames have to be welded much more closely together. The steel is orders of magnitude thicker, so you got to figure out how to bend it, and then you got to figure out how to weld all that. You have to heat the steel to 200 degrees before you can weld it, and you can't always do that with the human arm. Uh, you have to perfect robotic welding and some other processes. Bollinger, Mississippi is building the polar security cutter for us uh, down in Pascagoula. I was just down in the shipyard. I'm really optimistic about uh, where that acquisition is going. Has it been delayed? Yes. Are we frustrated by that? Yes, but I am very optimistic that we're going to be able to start cutting steel uh, by the end of this year. Uh, we need to uh, mature, detailed design. I think we'll get there, and as I said, I'm very optimistic about that, um, and I know they, they've got an incredible workforce down there, an incredible leadership, so uh, again, that fuels my optimism, and uh, we continue to have great congressional support. And, and when we talk about the polar security cutter, I think there's a natural tendency to say this is a Coast Guard cutter. Uh, let me reframe that a little bit. This is a national asset. Mm -hmm. It may have a Coast Guard racing stripe on it, but it is a national asset. And we are working this with a joint program office with the Navy. Thank you for the Navy's support on the acquisition strategy and moving this forward. Uh, on the offshore patrol cutter, uh, we've got the first one in the water. Uh, again, some delays in that program. Uh, Shipbuilding's hard. Um, and, and it delays are expected. Uh, we wanna try and get that first ship delivered as, as soon as possible. The first four are gonna be built down at Eastern Shipbuilding in Panama City, and then the second phase of the contract, five through 15, will be built at Austell. I was just down at Austell as well, and I've seen how they've transitioned from aluminum to steel. Their steel production capability is pretty impressive, um, and the shipyard itself is very impressive, so I'm encouraged there. Waterways Commerce Cutter, we're really at the beginning stages of that. Contract's been issued to Burdon. Uh, they're going to start building the majority of that cutter down in Bayou Battery, Alabama. I'll be down there in a couple of weeks to visit them. Uh, so I'm excited there. The other thing I didn't mention in my opening comments is we have almost fielded a full program record of fast response cutters, 154-foot cutters that are just doing uh, Herculean effort. And Congress has seen the value of that, our crews have seen the value of it, and we've actually been able to expand the program of record and hopefully keep that production line going. And, and the FRCs are being built down in uh, Bollinger and Lockport, Louisiana, I incredible assets for our folks. Um, I, I think, what can we do better? I, I think we have to look hard at our acquisition processes um, to ensure that we can avoid technical obsolescence. What do I mean by that? When you look at the acquisition rules and the strategies, they're really focused on building capital assets. I'm not sure we have the complete agility that we need on the C5I suites and technological infrastructure. And so we're gonna have to pivot a lot more quickly on C5I to avoid technical obsolescence. We've learned that lesson the hard way in the Coast Guard. Uh, so we're trying to stay ahead of that. It's not just cyber. It's about leveraging technology that changes at very quick pace. So thanks. Yeah, great. Um, Admiral Morley, I, you know, there's been a lot of talk of 45-day studies, and the Secretary's been uh, pretty vocal about, you know, some of the challenges here. A anything you can, you know, add to that discussion? And, and again, from seeing it on the RDA yep. side, um, kind of where are you in terms of moving from issue identification to kind of action? Right. out of that assessment. No, thanks, sir. The, uh, yeah, so a lot of, t uh, the, you know, we did the rollout of that uh, uh, here last week, uh, Mr. Girton and, um, and then uh, Armel Downey uh, did the initial talk and of course, um, and then discussions uh, with uh, many folks prior to me, so uh, on that, but, uh, um, so not to reiterate too heavily, but uh, certainly the, uh, you know, the purpose was, hey, let's, let's uh, you know, one of the Navy cultural items we may talk about later, but uh, is a hey, relentless pursuit of improvement, right? Whether you're on track or whether you're off track, you've got to keep digging in, right? So, hey, you know, there's a lot of challenges with shipbuilding. We've all talked about it there and we could see the performance. So, Secretary ordered, let's take a, let's take a good, another look at that. We've got a few different set of eyes uh, in the building on that. And uh, let's take a look at our constraints and challenges out of that. Let's embrace the red. 
right? Let's embrace where we're, uh, where we're not performing uh, on that and then try to learn from that and drive even further uh, mitigations from all the stuff that we're currently doing uh, on there. So, uh, so reviewed all the major programs. Some of those are, are pretty stable, you know? I mean, DDG, the AMFIBs, the TAOs out in the West, uh, you know, so we can build ships fairly stable, but new construction, first of class uh, challenges, the complexity of submarines, as well as the ramp up that I talked about, we're seeing, uh, seeing s some, uh, some significant challenges there. So we looked at each of those individually, first cut uh, on that. I think the, the initial findings, as many of you have heard, is that uh, there's no big surprises here, right? That's good, I guess, in the fact that, you know, we didn't uncover something that was, we just weren't looking at uh, on that. It's, um, it's bad because it sure would have been nice if we could just change a clin and a contract and all would have been solved, right? So uh, there, but we gained a, another fresher, more detailed uh, look and aspect of that to try to attack many of these challenges that we've uh, talked about and were just detailed, so I won't, uh, won't relist theirs uh, there. I think uh, bottom line though, uh, you know, now uh, heavy assessment, it, it, was, it validated a lot of our understanding. Uh, it gave us a, a, another uh, deeper uh, look and understanding of some of those constraints. Uh, there is no single smoking gun or easy fix to any of this. Uh, but it's all a part of transparent, ruthless pursuit of, uh, of improving performance there in a measured, very measured, fact-based data way, so. Thanks. Um, and Dr. Carl Smith, you, you know, OHD, you get a little bit of a once removed from the program, so you see things kind of across the entire enterprise. Um, are there lessons learned you've seen on how to set up programs for success and some things that as, as both services think through either fixing current programs or starting new ones that they had to keep in mind uh, from that perspective? Yes, sir, good question. So one of the things that we've really focused on is the multi-year procurement aspect of things. As Vice Admiral Morley mentioned, uh, we have focused a lot on munitions as of late and and we have been successful in the last year getting six of seven multi-year procurements for munitions. And correct, we should take those as lessons learned. But what the multi-year approach actually did was provide a stable demand signal that tried to address that ambiguity and uncertainty that um, does come around with not having that steady demand signal. And, and the hope is that it's not just providing the steady demand signal for the prime, but also those second and third tier suppliers so that they can actually plan ahead and have their stability in their workforce so that they can actually procure the long lead items that they need and they have that stability as well. We also are trying to address the long lead items that we need and trying to get those ahead of schedule and really working with Congress to procure long lead items ahead of time. Um, we are working to invest in the industrial base uh, facilitization and enhancements so that we can actually get to a point where we are not always at a minimum sustaining rate to uh, the Vice Admiral's point where we can actually surge. We, you know, we're not always actually operating at capacity, but we have that buffer where we can surge to increase capacity when needed. So, and, and that's not necessarily with munitions, but it can be with shipbuilding as well where we have that space to maneuver. We have that workforce agility that we need. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna probably ask one more question here and then if you guys have any from the audience, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go. So I will audible a little bit here uh, and move off of traditional shipbuilding, uh, which we've done a pretty good talk about. And I'm gonna ask you, Vice Commandant, uh, you mentioned uncrewed as something the Coast Guard's kind of thinking about, as well as technical obsolescence as an issue that, that you've got your eye on besides just the acquisition of capital ships. Can you maybe dig into that a little bit in terms of both operationally, how you see that fitting into the Coast Guard mission, and then how does that translate into the acquisition of those capabilities? Uh, that's a great question. So let me be clear, we will never replace manned Coast Guard cutters. You can't interdict drug smugglers with autonomous vessels. You can't save lives with autonomous vessels. You need humans and human-directed uh, uh, 
uh, ships, manned ships. But I think unmanned systems can be an important part of our fleet mix, both our aviation fleet mix to provide more persistent maritime patrol craft, but also our surface fleet. I, I think really it's about detection and monitoring, sorting and queuing. That's where I see the greatest value right now with, with unmanned systems to take the search out of search and rescue, uh, to be more efficient and effective with how we deliver uh, manned Coast Guard presence. Uh, we're, we're still gonna need those Coast Guard individuals that can go out and exercise the mission on scene to use trained initiative and, uh, and uh, you know, every, every, all the authorities that come with uh, the Coast Guard. Uh, but I think we can do it in a, in a uh, smarter way with unmanned systems. It's gonna take us a while to get there. Uh, we're now working with sail drone. We've got a number of sail drones deployed down in the Caribbean for detection and monitoring. We're working that in coordination with the U.S. Navy. Uh, I think there's a lot of possibilities there. Uh, we also have a joint program office with Customs and Border Protection to look at long-range uh, unmanned aerial systems. I think we, we need to really think hard about where we want to be in the next uh, several decades with unmanned systems. You know, we're, we're going to need rotary wing aircraft to pull people out of the water. Uh, we're going to need uh, the heavy lift capability that you really can't get with the UAS, but I think there's a, a, a really important capability that, that we have yet to fully leverage. Can All right. I add to that real quick? Yeah, go ahead, Spring. The, uh, the, the other neat thing about this, so exact same points there, uh, obviously uh, it, uh, it's capacity, uh, it's more sensing, it floods the zones, and the Navy standpoint, it's, it's potential kinetic uh, operations. Uh, it certainly makes the uh, adversaries uh, problem a lot harder uh, to deal with. Uh, it's uh, ex expendable in some ways. It's, uh, it's uh, lower risk to human, to friendly human life. Uh, in penetrating a very extensive, uh, you know, weapon engagement zones, et cetera. So, so the, it's, it's a very fertile ground. It will be a hybrid fleet. We all understand that. Uh, there's a place for, uh, for both, and we're still, I think, both kind of working through uh, the overall con ops on that. But uh, from, a, um, from a way of doing business side, it's, it's uh, really exciting uh, because what we're, we're in an era right now where we see that... Um, that uh, there are some key operational challenges and problems and gaps that we have that can be solved somewhat or mitigated by some pretty um, relatively low capital expense uh, equipment that's also fairly commercially uh, competitive uh, out there, right? So, uh, so you're seeing uh, DOD as a whole set up these kind of bridging organizations, uh, most of which have three letter identifiers, RCO, DCO, at UTF, you know, you name it. Um, but basically what they're doing is they're sitting there identifying uh, some operational problems that need resolving today, looking at both commercial and government tech that's pretty darn mature on there, and then accountable to bring that over, the classic bridge the gap. But you can do that pretty quickly at relatively low cost, and so you can adjust somewhat inside a budget year uh, in order to do that prototype field uh, and then tie it into a longer program of record without sitting on your hands for two, three years. So it really is an exciting opportunity because that stuff solves some key problems to look at how do we do things differently. All right, and, and I'll keep going here. If somebody's got a question, come up to the mic and, and we'll fire away. Go ahead, sir. Great, thanks. Uh, Rob Morrissey from Palantir. Um, I was curious, Admiral Morley, um, you spoke about moving some of the work from the prime shipyards to the middle of the country. Um, there's been some good coverage of the Secretary's trip to Asia recently. I'm wondering if you could speak to how the Navy's thinking about working with allies and partners, especially as we think about not just new builds, but also a conflict that might have you know, the need to sustain platforms in theater. No, it's great, thank you. Uh, by the way, I got to do a fireside chat with uh, Dr. Karp uh, with all our flag officers a few weeks ago, so it was a uh, Learned a lot about Palantir preparing for it and uh, had, a, had a real good uh, fun time with, uh, with uh, Dr. Karp and we, uh, uh, I learned about some great clubs in uh, East Berlin too. So the, uh, <laughs> the uh, yeah, so allies and partners are huge, right? And, um, the, uh, and, and guess what, whether you're on a playground or in the world's oceans or the Navy, pretty much history proves that the, those with the most friends tend to win. And it is the key strategic advantage that we all have here, not only the US, but our partners that are here running around sea, air, and space as well. So that is, that is huge on that. Our navies combined, both combatants, uh, logistics, sensors, shooters, 
uh, basing uh, are all uh, huge force multipliers uh, if, if for deterrence or if we have to go otherwise from there. S to the shipbuilding side, you see a lot more, hey, there's a lot we can learn, right? One of the culture things from the Navy is looking outside your own lifeline, seeing what world class is and trying to adopt those to your own efforts, right? So, you know, when we stopped subsidizing, the world commercial market was replaced by Japan and Korea, fortunately for us, and then China uh, out there. A lot to learn from Japan and Korea uh, and their industries. They're outstanding. So, so there's the learning aspect of it as well. There's also the potential foreign investment in bringing some of that expertise here to help with that maritime statecraft, the Secretary del Toro's, and help shore up a little bit of that industrial base. Austell's an example of that. Uh, hugely successful in building... Uh, the, uh, you know, half of our LCS is uh, pretty darn efficiently and then converting within the two years into a pretty major steel uh, capability. So there are those opportunities. And then there's the overseas opportunities within uh, the U.S. laws uh, with regards to our ability to voyage repair or to uh, potentially do some, uh, you know, interim uh, type work and repair. So kind of looking at uh, all that and, uh, and, and as we should. Great. Thank you. Sure. Hey, Mr. Gertz, thank you very much for having the panel. It's a, it's a great discussion. I, I really kind of want to focus on the capacity piece of the shipbuilding uh, discussion in that, you know, we've shuttered several large yards, and when we're talking about capital ships, you, you, can't, you can't put a shipyard wherever you want to. There's a limited number of locations that you can put them. Um, having them all located on a single or in a single geographic area is a strategic vulnerability. So are there, and with the Jones Act, we really can't go too far outside the uh, continental United States, but uh, are there efforts afloat to really take an opportunity for those shipyards that were shuttered and use those areas to modernize? Now that would be a, need to be a national uh, initiative, certainly, uh, a lot of the cities and states aren't going to support it. Let me take that. Uh, so, uh, so, so none of those issues are afloat because w they would be land-based uh, shipyards. But the, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I had to go there. Um, yes and no. Um, I think the priority right now, and probably the uh, the the more um, quicker response lever, if you will, for uh, nearer term benefit. Um, is outsourcing, strategic outsourcing of work. And, um, and so uh, because, as you said, the, the major shipyards that do exist are, are, are at or near capacity and have workforce challenges. And so there's, um, and our workforce efforts are, are challenged with, uh, with low unemployment, et cetera. So the more that we can spread that out across, I can build an airplane in all 50 states or at least 48 of them typically. Uh, on that, the more we can spread that uh, to other places. So what you're seeing effort on, and Dr. you may uh, comment on this, is more of the outsourcing to take workload off of those major shipyards and move that elsewhere um, to other facilities, to other workforces, et cetera, to help do more uh, parallel work. Um, there are some discussions, uh, you know, with regards to new shipyards and things. I would tell you that's still probably more in the uh, political sphere uh, and, and discussion sphere and, and above my pay grade on that one. But, uh, um, but that's where we're focused on is, uh, is strategic outsourcing of work. Yes, sir, that's what we've seen uh, being the biggest benefit is actually taking some of the modules or some of the components and actually pushing those um, to different organizations to actually build separately and then integrate later. So it is working. There are pro efforts to do that, and we will continue to push those as much as we can. If I could just add w one thing on, on top of the comments. Uh, it, it's not just about ship construction. It's about ship repair capacity mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so this goes fundamentally to maintenance and sustainability. And I think uh, right now we find ourselves in an uncomfortable position where we often have to compete uh, for limited shipyard capacity. So the 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 theme of your question is a really good one. How do we expand the defense industrial base, especially with respect to, to shipbuilding? And we're falling behind when you look at other international partners. I, I mean, I think we have to look at shipbuilding capacity as a strategic need 
for the nation as well as ship repair capacity. And this goes back to uh, what Frank said, and that is, you know, maritime statecraft. How are we going to invest in maritime statecraft to expand the defense industrial base that's going to be able to accommodate all of our sea services? And, and oh, by the way, our commercial needs as well. And, and the need to continue to build vessels that operate in the Jones Act can't be lost either. I mean, you know, 90 percent of goods and services or goods are lifted on our uh, marine highways. Yeah, I think the one, uh, just as an aside comment, I, I think moving to network thinking on this and building this network um, that's got enough of the nodes for repair, enough of the nodes for construction, and then can access all of the capacity that's out there. When I look at, you know, one level up from the specific initiatives, I think that's what we're really trying to craft, to include allies and partners in that. Uh, that's what we've got to rebuild that kind of, that network that used to exist we can't think of it as like a static base moving forward. So great question. Sir. Thank you. Honorable Gertz, thank you. Mark Fideli, Chorus. Um, we've been studying some of the problems related to decision making at the sort of design and the requirements phase. So our software allows decision makers to do less data calls, more thinking about the problem. And one area we've uncovered, um, even visiting folks like Virginia, Virginia Digital Maritime Center who have the analysts who are really thinking through, let's look at SpaceX or others who have developed on a smaller number of core requirements, the design of the future versus starting with a typical list of long requirements that challenge the design and make it very difficult to take those elegant component ele uh, elements that the, the, the big thinkers can develop and put into a shipbuilding process and maybe componentize that network. Has much thought been given to how to maximize or optimize the shortest list of requirements that you could give to industry and kind of yield maybe some of the design flexibility. I'm sure that's a common problem, but is the data there to allow those trade-offs between those design offers from industry and that long list of requirements to get those decisions made faster so the network can say, okay, we're in the design business. We're not just in the given requirements business and trying to bend the laws of physics to requirements that made sense in a committee meeting. Yeah, let me, let me take a first stab at this, and, and then I'll turn it over. Um, th this is an important process question, right? Uh, I think I have been frustrated throughout the course of my career with requirements creep. And what we're trying to do is instill some discipline in our processes to establish clear requirements uh, that will drive the acquisitions process. Um, and I think if we do that, one, we're going to get better price validation. Yeah. Uh, it's going to become more efficient, and it's going to avoid uh, the need for contracts adjustments and, and price creep in the, in the long run. Uh, I've seen too many acquisitions where we've either been ambiguous with the requirements or we've changed requirements midstream. And I understand the world gets a vote on this, but I think it's about discipline in our acquisitions process, but that has to start with those who are setting the requirements uh, for the service. Yeah, it, it's the age-old question, right? Uh, and as an acquisition uh, person, yeah, yeah please. Uh, I, I want the most trade space and flexibilities I can get, and uh, uh, on there as as would the industry partners, but uh, but in a way, but as a uh, as the you know ultimate customer receiver too, I got to make sure that uh, that uh, you know we balance that with the fact that I get uh, uh, say in. Navy's case, or I think all our cases, a, a, a seaworthy ship that uh, takes advantage of the lessons learned over, uh, you know, uh, centuries of uh, combat and uh, certainly of modern ships of what it takes to um, keep one, you know, damage control requirements and flooding requirements and, and all these type of things. So it, it is it, it is the age old um, challenge uh, on that. So, you know, frigate. Um, you know, there's only been post post contract award four requirements changes: two by the Navy, one because of a vendor uh, system that wasn't uh, maturing, and then a, and a, a crew compartment thing. And then there were two that were uh, came from Congress. Um, that ain't bad uh, in today's. Um, but understanding the uh, requirements that we do have, uh, you know, complexities to, for Navy spec, et cetera, and probably taking a look. Um, you know, on a regular basis about our specs and, and challenging ourselves, there are all very valid efforts. Yeah, the, the only other piece I'll just add is differentiating the equipment. 
So how you treat the capital asset that's going to be in the water for 30 years versus the uh, sensors or the weapons or the AI algorithms. We've got to be, you know, some you want to have very fluid, some you don't. I, I don't think we are, there's probably opportunity to better differentiate where you can have flexibility that doesn't impact the core structure build and the core platform and, and, and where you don't have a lot of flexibility because it's going to be in the water for 50 years. Um, that would be the only thing I would add. Great question. Sir. Thank you. Uh, Mark Kennedy, Wilson Center. Uh, is there an ORCA size on man that can sidestep the constraints we have on shipbuilding and be built in a factory in any 48 states that, that can help with the capacity constraints that the forces are looking for? Uh, well, there's an ORCA sized ORCA that's being built where it's being built right now. Um, I, I, I'd say that's, um, it's an interesting question. I don't think that exists right now because there's one ORCA and we've got to get that in the water and mature and, and floating, but that the thinking and the question is in the right direction that there are um, potentially, particularly in the unmanned area, um, um, things that could be constructed in whole um, that, are, uh, that are, aren't near the water, right? If they're, uh, you know, we certainly can build up to, uh, you know, uh, DDGs outside of a dry dock, uh, but you need them pretty close to the water to put them in there. Uh, but uh, when you talk about something smaller that could actually be shipped, um, then you certainly can build them outside the water, and then I think you're constrained as our ability to ship them, or a w inland waterway, or the likes like that. Yep. So, so, Admiral Morley, what's the Navy doing in thinking, back to the question of should we open up more shipyards, we sometimes think of that in traditional shipyards, mm -hmm. like an HII right. or something. Folks may not remember, you know, we built 26 submarines in, uh, up in the Great Lakes. Yep. Um, we used to do, has the Navy thought or is the Navy starting to think differently about new platforms not having to access the same overloaded industrial base right. and look, is, is that into the thinking space yet? Yeah, no, it certainly is. It's, it's uh, you know, where we see the most advancement is in the unmanned again, because it allows us the opportunity to think and act and operate differently, right? So many of those, they're not as much platform centric as they are software centric. Um, and so many different folks can build them um, from many different places and from, to your point, sir, from many different companies and industries that aren't traditionally a shipbuilder or a defense uh, company. So yeah, that's the exciting part of the space is we're able to uh, expand the, uh, the industrial base in a different dimension uh, from the traditional. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. Uh, Marshall Branch with TQI Solutions. Uh, Admiral uh, Poulin, if I may uh, direct one your way, sir. Uh, great to see you again, sir. Uh, as, as you noted, and as several others have noted over the last three days, there's never been a higher demand on Coast Guard assets uh, than this time that we're in. It is truly the time of Coast Guards. Uh, most nations, most maritime nations identify their maritime services more aligned as our Coast Guard based upon their missions and their size. Um, the 11 missions that we do are growing. Uh, the area that we're operating in increasing. Uh, we're doing this recapitalization, as you're talking about, uh, replacing legacy assets that are 50 to 80 years old with much more modern and much more complex uh, platforms. Uh, our legacy assets had a uh, demand rate and a uh, readiness rate uh, and a pace that uh, was unique to the Coast Guard. Um, as we get these more complex platforms online and we start to bring them in, are we gonna look at maybe going to a uh, optimized fleet readiness plan or response plan like similar to the Navy to keep up with the maintenance demands and requirements on those complex assets? Yeah, it's great to see you again, and thanks for the, for the question. Sure. Um, we're having a leadership council meeting um, in early May. Leadership council is when we bring our three stars together with me and the commandant to, to talk about strategic issues. The centerpiece of that discussion will be on how we sustain our Coast Guard fleet. Do we need to change our maintenance model? And you're right, it's, it's much different than the way the Navy does it. Our cycle time for national security cutters is about 90 days, right? 90 days out, 90 days in, then you turn them. Our medium endurance cutter is 45 to 60 days, and then we turn them. Um, I don't know that that's the right model for us, even in the wake of increasing demand. So we've got to think about a smarter, better way uh, to maintain our, our new assets that are coming online. That new capabilities 
really important. I, I look at what our national security cutters are doing. If you have a force package of integrated newer assets, they are so much more productive than the legacy assets. And, and I think we've proven that and the, and the data shows that. But we have to make sure that we can put those on vector, on time, and on need. And so we're going to have those very difficult conversations about whether we need to culturally change, uh, whether this is a process change, or whether we just need to invest differently. And part of that will probably be operational design. Thanks. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, hi, Greg Jost with uh, Tridentis. We're ship design engineers. Uh, but my question, uh, it's interesting hearing the dialogue here because I think we all understand a lot of the challenges we face with uh, workforce, with capacity, with uh, budgets and, and innovation. Uh, I sometimes feel like we're all talking to each other, <laughs> but there's this whole world outside of our industry. Um, you know, national level priority, national level discussion that all these conversations here don't seem to trickle into, at least to the point where there's meaningful investment or change or direction or support from the very top. I mean, I'm talking president, Congress, senior leaders, senior industry all around the, the country. Uh, what can we do as industry and as uh, government uh, to engage the entire nation in the priorities that we obviously, that, that are so obvious to us? Thank you. I'll start uh, real quick. Uh, so, um, you know, if you approach these things, uh, you try to take care of your own house, you try to explain the uh, challenge, and then you try to, um, um, influence uh, above, right? So um, certainly in the Navy's case, the 45-day assessment uh, not only is an internal effort to look at the problem again and, uh, and understand more clear, it's also a way to be completely transparent on the challenges we have. The Secretary's, uh, you know, maritime statecraft is exactly to your point. I'm going to try to do what I can. I'm going to try to um, to encapsulate uh, the challenge, and I'm going to try to influence uh, at a more national level because of the critical strategic importance of this. So, so that's an effort in there. And then I would say, uh, you know, a hey, Congress is. Uh, I mean, there is a lot of money coming in for submarine industrial base expansion. There, a lot of uh, valuable treasured uh, taxpayer dollars uh, in order to invest. So I think uh, I think that message is is getting out. Um, and, and now we're going to have to put that, it's going to be our responsibility to put that to work and industries in a way that makes a de deliverable outcome as we go. So point well taken, efforts underway, um, you know, we're somewhere in the middle. Go ahead. From the Secretary's perspective, we just released the National Defense Industrial Base Implementation Plan, um, and that really has a section on the industrial base for shipbuilding and how we're addressing that. Um, in addition, we have stood up an organization called the Joint Production Acceleration Cell, which looks at um, sp specific choke points within uh, a supply chain to try to address those, whether it be like an obsolescence issue, whether it be a long lead issue, things like that, that maybe we can invest uh, resources into to try to speed those things up to kind of help industry um, pull things to the left, right, with for regard to production. Um, that's one of the things that the undersecretary has really invested in and really looked at. But uh, to the Admiral's point, the submarine industrial base has really been uh, a big focus for Congress in the past couple years. But remember those investments that we put in, in in say 23, we won't realize those investments probably for another two to three years as the money's just now really kind of hitting industry and kind of uh, showing some of the development of where that money has actually been invested. So we may not see the results for two years, right? So it, it's coming, it's just, it will be slow. It won't be instantaneous, is what I'm saying. I think the last thing I would just add to that as we finish up here, um, I think there is some recognition. There are certainly some resources, but we have collectively have got to execute. Mm -hmm. um, and that we've got to be able to show that collectively between uh, the public side and the private side, we can put those resources to bear to produce outcomes. I think if we can do that and show that those resources are making 
changes and those are reflected in outcomes, that will then accelerate more resources coming in. If we dump a bunch of resources and it doesn't look like we've collectively figured out how to put those to bear, then they'll start questioning, well, I understand the problem, but the way you want to solve it by dumping resources isn't going to get there. So I, if I've always got the problem anyway, I might as well put those resources somewhere else. So my, my ask for all of us or, or where we've got to all dedicate ourselves, I think, to deliver on the capabilities that the Secretary of Defense needs, that the Department of the Navy needs, that the Coast Guard needs, is figure out how to break down those barriers, create that network, and then actually put these resources where they can really make an impact. I think if we collectively do that, that will build the momentum. You know, there, we're great transparency. We're not hiding that we've got challenges. We're not denying that we've got challenges. We're starting to get resources to get after it. Now we've actually got to go off and execute. And so my ask as an, as an old has-been, uh, who's fortunate to be back here with all of you, is figure out how to go execute better whether you're on the government side or on the industry side or on the academic side or on the congressional side or international partner side. Uh, if we can all kind of lean into this, then I do think we can deliver what the nation needs. Thanks again for all of your time. Thanks for uh, listening to us. Thank you to the panelists. Very, very well done. Well done.